Suspiria, 1977, by director Dario Argento. This is from the world of giallo cinema. Gialli, at their most basic, are Italian horror films from the 60s and 70s involving mystery, murder, and voyeurism, the witnessing of a murder, containing elements and tropes of blood and gore, the psychological thriller, exploitation cinema, violence against attractive women, a gloved unknown killer uses blades and reveals him or herself at the end of the film, melodramatic acting, and a focus on visuals and editing over plot. Giallo is Italian for yellow, and the genre takes its name from the yellow covers of pulp crime novels and the translations of mysteries that inspired the genre. So Rick, tonight I'm asking you, number one, how familiar are you with the yellow genre? Two, how familiar are you with Suspiria specifically? And three, tell us why you didn't like it. <laughs> Oh, you mind-reading bastard, you. Um, <laughs> I'm not familiar at all with uh, with the Italian horror movie scene. Um, and in fact, well, you know, it's weird because uh, a viewing such as this could really put shit into perspective where you, where you start to look at things and say, well, wait a minute, maybe... You know, when you, when you, love, when you love cinema and when you love movies as much as I do, you think you kind of get arrogant and feel like, well, I know this and I know that and I know all of this and there's there's not a lot that's new. And Italian cinema is a very, um, it's a very ambitious and very um, renowned culture for, for, for movies. And as I watched this film, I realized I don't know a whole lot about, outside of the big names, Rossellini, um, <clears throat> Fellini and of course uh, Sergio Leone. That's three directors. I can't speak to. I can't speak to Italian film in the know same way. Bertolucci too, a little bit. Bertolucci, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, Bertolucci, but but that's four. You yeah. know, that's four names in in a hundred and some odd years of filmmaking. It's not the same as. Uh, I even know I even know French cinema better than I do Italian. Um, it's not like Japanese. It's not like you know where where I really know that world a little bit better. Chinese, Hong Kong cinema. Um, so what I know of the giallos was, as a lot of people out there, um, these these ridiculous, expansive interviews that. Tarantino does where he just raves on and on and on and um, I knew of the existence of this genre I knew that the Italians were famous for their horror films but as I've said in the past on, on pretty much each of the last uh, three or four episodes I'm not a big fan of the horror genre as a whole I think it's it's a very um, it's a very labored genre and it's a very difficult it's a very difficult genre to to um to be successful at because a lot of it is just straight out gore um every once in a while you find something that that you, you find true visionaries carpenter toby hooper um the um the early films of the the universal films uh you know it it has as much validity as any other genre is what i'm saying but it didn't have a wealth of viewing experience with this genre. I knew of the film. I knew of Suspiria even before the remake two years ago, two or three years ago, however long that was. And I knew that this was considered a classic of the genre. That being said, <clears throat> yeah, I did not enjoy it. I, I, 
I, I watched this film and I kept asking myself, how the fuck is this considered a classic? How is this considered groundbreaking? And, and then I realized groundbreaking is, is really tentative because that's, that's based on what has come before and what comes after. But I really didn't understand why this film was held in such high regard. I was bored. I was disinterested. And I realized that, that the one good thing about it was, though, I, I said to myself, if this is the best and this is Dario Argento's masterpiece, then I don't have to dig into Argento. I don't have to see The Crystal Plumage or whatever that film is or, or any of the other um, myriad films that he's done. If this is the best, I've just saved my time. I just saved myself serious time in having to dig through this filmography and this um, this specific genre of horror. So I think that answers the questions that you're asking. How did it you does. know that I would, how did you know that I disliked it so? <laughs> because we all know. <laughs> no, did you like it? I, I did. I liked it and I, there are parts of it that I didn't like and I think that was what really kind of um that's what think about the ramones um there were the you hear about people's reaction to the ramones at cbgb um mm -hmm. and people will talk about it they talk about it in the, there's a documentary punk attitude you you, you hear that kind of from multiple sources where people say that they, they're like, what the fuck is this band? Yeah. They're fighting. They're all playing different songs. Like, at, like they at start the same different time. songs like at the same time. <laughs> um, they, they start and stop. They're playing super fast. Their set list is really short. Um, fuck this band. And, you know, whoever's doing the interview or whatever, whoever's, they, they, they talk about how they, they, they left. And then the next day they were back. Um, and it's kind of like, they're so bad, they're good. Um, to me, I, I was, I was, to me, I was looking at a paradox while I was watching this because I'd seen it years and years and years ago. And I'd seen scenes from Deep Red, another uh, film of his, but I'm watching this and number one, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing aspects of cinema history before the film, and I can also see influences after. But we'll talk about that after. Yeah. Uh, right, right now, I'm, I'm, I, my overall impression was that I see the influences, but I also see something that's unique. I see at times something that's very lowbrow, but at the same time, low, you know, lowbrow and trashy. Mm -hmm. Um, like there are elements where I'm like, I'm waiting for the porn scene. I'm waiting for the lesbian sex scene at, at, at some point because it, it looks like that's what it, what, what it is. Yeah. Um, but then I'm seeing all at the same time, something that's very highly stylized and, um, and highly artistic and operatic and very, very, um, deliberate in the choices, deliberate in a way that separate something from some haphazard low budget fucking hack so-called hack cinema or whatever yeah um i'm seeing something that is ridiculous but also engaging mm -hmm. something that's ugly or can be ugly you know in quotes but also beautiful um did you say can be ugly or can't be ugly or camp. both the, mm -hmm. no that's great because it's it, I see camp too yeah. um, well, I said can be mm. but can't be as well um, okay. uh, something that's definitely of its time but it's so fucking peculiar that it's like um, it's timeless um, so this kind of made me want to um, I, I had the opposite reaction I think some of the same elements that drove you away uh, I'm curious because every, 
look, some film styles and some dramas, they have their own grammar, their own symbols, their own tropes. Yeah. And I believe that you have to engage in those things um, based on what they are. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to why, kind of like why did they, first of all, I want to see more of these films because I want to see I want to see the parallels in these tropes that I described that you, you see because I've seen now I was watching like some documentaries, some clips, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, reading about it um, because I was curious um, to kind of get a sense of what is this genre, um, and now I want to see those. I want to see the different films with the gloved killer. I want to see the blades. I want to see um, this. Do they all have the, the, the acting? Is it similar in all of them? Is it what are the visuals like? What's the difference? What separates Argento from other Giallo directors? Um, so it's kind of like it, it's it piqued my interest because it, it, it almost became, and I was as I was watching the film, I was almost becoming like addicted like when you're reading a book and at first mm -hmm. you, you know it may, maybe it takes a while to kind of get into it but then now you're turning the pages and you're like well what's going to happen yeah. and what i want to know this language it's interesting um let me pursue this now on top of that i'm looking at hitchcock i'm seeing elements of keeping tom michael powell um I'm seeing Brian De Palma, um, things that are coming before this film. But I'm also looking at the film and I'm seeing, I'm seeing Shelley Duvall in the corner in, in The Shining. I'm seeing even Basic Instinct. And I'm, and I'm, I'm reading and learning about uh, Jalo and I'm like, Basic Instinct is inspired by Jalo. It's inspired by noir and it's inspired and it's it's kind of ridiculous like that, but that's kind of what it is. I'm seeing the color influences on Gaspar Noé and um, Nicholas Winding Refn. I even see some Holorowski in there in terms of like the set pieces and and the way that they you the way that each director Holorowski and, and Argento respectively use characters moving through kind of set pieces so you see them in parallel um, and it's big and they're doing it differently but kind of like some aspects of maybe Holy Mountain the way the way that Polarowski has a character moving and then in this the, the main protagonist the female is walking through these fucking highly stylized theatrical set pieces or whatever um, so it my reaction was completely the opposite of yours. You're saying, I saw this. I never have to see anything else again. Yeah. I'm like, I saw this. I want to see different shit because I want to compare it to this. I want to see, I want to explore this world more. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like, I feel like what you're saying is like, no, I've been to, I've been to the United States or you're saying I've been to, I went to the projects. I've been to LA before. And it's like, well, from the desert to the sea to all of Southern California, as Jerry Dunphy, the old uh, news guy, used to say, there are many aspects, yeah. not just one. Yeah, but I'm being, I'm also, I'm also citing something where it's like, it's, it's not as, it's not as dismissive as you're, as you're making it seem. It's what I'm saying is, look. There's a couple I mean, of different I'm, aspects. I'm, I'm, okay. There's it, a couple of different aspects. I'm never going to gonna see anything again. That's how, how you don't clean it up. That's no, the fact is. is I don't have to see it again. The fact that th this is the thing. I have a limited amount of time, as you do, as the listener does, to dedicate yourself to the films that you think are going to be uh, rewarding. Um, contrary to, to the belief of, of a lot of regular people... I don't think cinema people go into movies hoping that the movie's going to suck. We don't go into a movie hoping to have a bad time 
or this this opportunity to shit on a movie or say we hated this or which I mean there are some miserable people out there that that live in that world I'm not one of them I want the movie experience to be a great one I want to walk out of there either laughing my ass off or contemplating uh, different aspects of 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 humanity or or the species I want to I want to be scared out of my mind I want to I want to laugh now, if I'm told, as I don't think I don't think I'm wrong on this, if I'm told that with Giallo, Suspiria is one of the greatest of this genre, and Dario Argento is one of the masters, and this is the film that is presented to me, I see that everything else, okay, there might be there might be some good things about the films, there might be there might be a diamond in the rough. Maybe some of the other films are more to my more to my taste. That's possible. But the fact of the matter is, am I gonna go in a direction that leads ultimately to to um lesser rewards or am I or am I going to go somewhere where I think that's a world that I want to explore that's a world that is going to be more and more rewarding um I don't want to dismiss things like I did back in the 90s with with David Lynch fortunately I came to I came to an understanding and I learned to embrace certain aspects that eluded me back then that I wasn't um I don't think I was either either uh, mature enough or intellectually at a place where I could take those films in for what they were. This is something different. This is I'm seeing I'm seeing very basic horror storytelling and films that are not really you know they're the for for my tastes, I'm not interested in just gore. I'm not interested in just a woman running running through um, a school, an academy, and um, this this gloved hand coming at her, and then the the slow the slow reveal of of a coven. I'm not I'm not really interested in that because the payoff. The tension leading up to the payoff doesn't pay me. So when they advertise this film as the scariest 12 minutes on film since the previous 92 minutes or something like that. They said something like that. What, what are the previous ones that they're talking about? The beginning of the film. But there so were the last one. So I get you. I get you. Know. you know what so I'm last, it was like the, a, yeah. film, yeah. the, the ending of the film is 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 number one, and <laughs> the previous fucking uh, the number two. That's the exactly. Stuff. That's what that's okay. what they were. That's how they advertise. That was one of the advertising taglines that they used in promoting this film. Um, okay, so they lied to you, Rick. I know they did. They um, lied to me. But that's the thing. Where where it's like I, okay. you know I know now that now I can go back to devoting my time to to Scorsese. How many films does he have well, left? Don't. No, I um, no, I can I can dig further into Fellini, which when I think about it, I've only seen about four films. I've only seen Eight and a Half, Juliet of the Spirits, um, what's that one with the hooker, Knights of Carreria, and La Dolce Vita, Knights of Carreria. <laughs> One of the most tragic endings I've ever seen on film. It breaks my heart. It made me cry right at the end. It was just. It was. But that's what I'm. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I need. I want. I need the hope of having one of those life changing movie watching experiences. And as I get older, I know they're fewer and far between. But I know that they're still out there. I'm excited right now because I'm diving into Bergman this weekend. I'm gonna watch scenes from a You're marriage. Hate it, yeah, what's that? You're gonna hate it. Maybe not. Maybe not. I mean, there are. I think. I think there's a level of drama and um, struggle in a film like Persona or Scenes from a Marriage. Scenes from a Marriage is where I'm gonna be starting. 
and I'm looking forward to this examination of the dissolution of a marriage. Um, but I also have the opportunity to watch the HBO remake with Oscar Isaacs and Jessica Chastain after that. So I'm interested in, in how Bergman is, um, I'm interested in how Bergman is going to be, is, how I'm going to absorb Bergman. And there is, there is that danger of me hating it because it's a, no pun intended, it's, it's a very foreign it's a, it's a foreign, it's a very foreign style of filmmaking to me. Well, that's but, I mean that's kind of the the that's the that I'm glad you chose that term because it's kind of like mm -hmm. um, I I'm not trying to offend you, but I, I think you're you're I think you're more close minded than you think you come off as. I think everybody is closed-minded to a certain degree. No. You're open-minded about no. certain things, but you you know. No, no, no. Um, no, no, no. The, it's, 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 no. The, the reason I disagree with you is because um, if you're closed-minded, you're kind of set in your ways of what you know, everything else is kind of like, eh, yeah, uh, um, someone who's more open-minded is more willing to explore other shit, regardless of the fact that there's like their home base of stuff, their wheelhouse, whatever. People who are more open-minded are more apt to more curious, more kind of like, okay, like I'll try that. And okay, maybe not my thing, but someone who's more close-minded is going to be quick to, to say no, this that's not me. That's not blah blah blah. Before they even try it, and then even if they ask, like if they try it, and it's like for whatever reason not what they expected, or not what they're used to, or not whatever, then it's like no, well, and this is why I knew that you were not going to like this film, and I think everyone who listens to to, the, to our show consistently. Um, if they've seen the film, um, are going to be like, oh yeah, Rick's not like this. Yeah, uh, but, aside from just style, but I, I but, think but general, not liking a film doesn't necessarily mean that I'm put off to new experiences or anything. That see, that's you know, I'm I'm put off to this, and I realize that. Uh, Yes, but most the, new experiences you're put off to them. But it's a, but it's also it's 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 a matter of in some ways the Italian style of filmmaking, which I don't. Uh, I mean, but I this know. week it's the Italian style. Next week it's the French style. The another yeah. week, uh, except for maybe Melville. Or, uh, but the um, thing about it is that they're still the, the they're still within. Well, no, Melville, Truffaut, I like I like um, I like some of the modern filmmakers coming out of out of uh, mm. French cinema, Italian and, cinema, but. And, it's it's and not separate, also separate from what we like. Separate from what we like, we have to be able to comment on certain things and also appreciate those things, even if they're not st something that we like. It's not, um, and I'm picking on you because uh, like, I think you do this consistently, and I want us to uh, dig deeper. Um, than just, well, this film is a failure, blah, 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 um, because, okay, why? Well, I didn't like it, or I was bored, or it's pretentious, which I read as pretentious means a foreign film that isn't Japanese, or an art film. Um, it's kind of like a stock answer. Uh, or gratuitous, which, what does that mean? Or all style which means it has a lot of style. Um, no, when I, I say all style, I more. when all style comes into play, all style is all style at the expense of story and performance. And, you know, look, there's a moment in this film where um, they bring in Udo Kier to explain everything. And I'm... And I remember seeing that, thinking, "Ah, oh, shit, this is fucking lazy. This is this is really lazy. This is where they, 
this is that moment where they bring somebody in to come in to come into the scene and explain to the hero what is actually going on. Um, yeah, this guy I, just I happens to be scary yeah. parts too. Um, I let let's let's step back. Let's talk about the premise, and then let's break down some of the aspects. And I want to ask you about aside from you. Um, you don't care for it, but I want to ask your. Um, I want to ask you uh, some other questions, but let, let, let's talk about the premise. Um, what's the premise of the film? What's it about? The premise is a young American woman comes to uh, Germany to join a, a dance academy. And uh, I don't know if she's been recruited. It was never really clear if she's been recruited as um, sacrificial for uh, uh, what is for what is basically a cover for um, a witch's coven. So with that, and witchery, I guess depending on the culture and where you're going to with it, can be interpreted. I see these are not Salem witches. These are not Japanese no witches. These are... These are uh, well, Salem German. witches were just fucking women that they didn't like, you know? <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> But there's this, uh, you know, there's this uh, idea. I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I don't know exactly what more was, no, but I get, was through I, that culture. But you saying. know what I'm saying? It's like so. Yeah, so I don't know what. Yeah, the th these are not brujerias. You know, these are not you know Mexican witches either. These are not. I, I'm not sure what. What the witches. It's just the, a generic... The, yeah, I don't know yeah, what the society witches. and culture of witches is in this film. I don't know if it's in line with, with demons, if it's in line with the devil himself. I don't know if it's a, um, a paganistic, uh, ritualistic society. You know, and it takes so long to get to that point in the film that you don't... Uh, I mean, a film, a film should build some kind of tension, and I guess for some people it does but it, it just seemed very it just seemed very um un I never I never felt that I was given anything to invest in. I either want to see I either want to see these people killed or I want to see them survive. Like you're like if you're watching Friday the Thirteenth, you want to see those kids die. If you're watching yeah. Halloween, you want to see Laurie Strode live, right? Because there's an investment. Either you hate the kids and you want to see them. They're 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 egotistical. They're arrogant. They're they have no respect for themselves or, or the scene around and for any other any number of uh, interpretations of those stories. I don't want to get into that too much, but. Or you have a character, which is the Jessica Harper character in this film, that you're rooting for, the last girl, the girl that you want to survive. I never felt like I knew anything about this girl enough to either want her to die or to want her to live. So, at the very, at, at, at its very, um, at its very basic storyline source, that this, this, there was no... There was no emotional or psychological investment, and I don't think I can see that. Yeah, that was for me. That was for me. Um, I I recognize that this is a genre that is beloved by many many people. So I take that into account when I watch it. I'm not a Fandango guy. I'm not a horror guy. So it is possible that I'm that I just don't. Fangoria? What's that? Is that what you mean? Fangoria? Was that what it was? Fangoria, yeah. That magazine from the eighties and nineties. Yeah. Um, I was not that guy. Uh I was never I was never into this shit in the way that they were. So in a sense, maybe I am missing something. Maybe I am. But um from from the perspective of of a film lover and watching films and watching stylistic shit. I felt like, um, like you talk about the, the production design, you talk about a little bit about the lighting. I thought it was too well lit. 
I thought it was too. I didn't like the. Um, I thought the. I thought the lighting was rather obvious. All of that red to indicate, you know, impending doom and evil, and it just it was. There was no there was no sense of of. Everything was at like, up to ten. It was through eleven. Yeah, um, well, that's when it goes should, into fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's when it goes into uh into um that uh that mockumentary, the rock. What is it? Um, uh, this is Spinal Tap. Spinal Tap. Yeah. yeah. Spinal Tap. Um, that, that's that's yeah. kind of it's not at ten. It's fucking at eleven. Yeah. Um, and I I can see how. I can see how, if we want to be cr critical of, if we want to depend on story, mm -hmm. if we want to, if, and, you know, uh, again, I, if you want story, there are plenty of novels that have fucking story. Mm -hmm. Novels do not need story, I don't think. Um, I love that school. I, I, feel, I feel that that's, a hundred years ago, we kind of, um, we, came to that point yeah. um whatever um i can see how if someone's going to be critical of this they can say look this is the problem with genre this is whatever is that you once you get into genre you, all you're doing is taking certain ingredients and then as long as those ingredients are present it doesn't matter what comes out you just mix the ingredients and say this is a, something of that job um I can see how someone can make that critique. I can see how someone can say, you can, you can like reverse engineer a Dario Argento film by putting in these fucking deeply saturated lights, wild ass music from uh, the band Goblin, um, get a, a, a woman to just walk through these like sets, um, have a, a, a knife, a glove, all this fake blood, edit it together, and then now you have an Argento film. That's that's it. It's yeah. all tropes. There's no there's nothing behind it. It's it's, it's a house of cards. Um, it's not that's it. I can see that that argument. Um, I can see that. Again, I want to look at other these other films to see. Well, what is what's how are they using this language of these like certain tropes that that, that, they're, that everyone's using, and what are they getting at with that? What what and and kind of also like why why and how does this how did this happen that that they they're using these particular tropes and why is it so appealing to so many people? I'm curious about the whole the whole thing. Um, without necessarily being like um, a fanboy, and at the same time without being like ah fuck that it's shit. Well, um, I'm not it's saying kind of like, fuck that and it's shit. I'm uh, saying and, that you and know. And no, I, I'm, 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 and I'm not a fan, so it's kind of like I'm taking it to the extremes. Um, but it's kind of like at some point you and I are going to revisit the Passion of the Christ. It was the the first, mm -hmm. um, the first episode we did, and I think um, it reminds me of that because in that, from what I remember, that you know, 2015, that 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 episode a lot of the time I think was spent um, talking about religions not in, in general yeah. religion in general um, and I think what um, and we kind of didn't have we didn't have a kind of understanding of how we operate in terms of a podcast um, together me at all and, and you with me um, so it's kind of like I'm coming from a place in so in that episode with Passion and I'm, this is a digression but I'm going somewhere um, in that episode of, of on Passion of the Christ Passion of Christ 
um, I, if I think about it, I, I would say that you're operate or you were operating as kind of like someone who was editorializing. And I was operating as someone who was reporting. And to have that like mix, sometimes the, there was a, there were like missed connections of kind of like one person's point versus the other one. Um, so the reason where I'm coming from in terms of, let's say, religion, specifically related to that episode and why I started talking to you on a microphone to begin with, um, it's not because, like, I didn't study theology in the seminary because I want to uh, promote some kind of religious view. That's not what I studied. I did study to some degree theology, but I studied the people who were studying theology also. So I'm looking at it from a perspective of like, um, and this is kind of like my position, um, is that I'm looking at different things, not necessarily as like a promoter of anything. Um, not even an advocate. If anything, I'm an advocate in terms of this show. I'm an advocate for beauty, however you define that. It can be, it doesn't have to be attractiveness or something that sells. It doesn't have to be influencer worthy. Um, that's not what I mean by beauty. I mean uh, something that elevates experience um, and is aesthetic. Um, whatever that aesthetic is. I promote like expanding one's awareness. I promote um, elevating one's experience and living for meaning and knowledge and pleasure and, and beauty um, and for doing new things to expand yourself within all genres, within all different types of art forms, etc. That's why I think people. Um, so when I talk about superior coming back to this, I'm just curious about the language, the grammar, um, how how it develops. Um, so I can see both sides of where you're coming from, why I personally, obviously I can speak to why I personally was intrigued by this. Um, without necessarily needing to die on some fucking hill for Dario Argento or for this genre. Um, that's something different. But, um, for example, with the style, um, with the lighting, okay, like, sure, red, blood. We, we understand that. Um, I think there were other aspects, there were other colors involved also, like... Um, there was yellow, there was purple. Um, well, you're saying, well, it's pretty obvious the light choice is red for blood, and I'm, okay, well, what is purple then? How was that obvious? Um, you can say that for the red, but when, if there's blue, does that mean that it was, did it symbolize water in that scene? Did it symbolize it was cold? Was blue for night? At that point, it's like, well, is it, how obvious is it? Um, I think you can make like certain snap judgments and certain kind of like, but if you really start to explore, and this is for both of us, but this is for like, if you like something or if you dislike it, we have to go further than just our initial reaction to something and question and what's the opposite argument and is there validity to that? Now beyond that, what do you see? This is a cold, kind of cold read because we're not familiar with Gialli, with, the, with, with these films. What do you see them taking from, and some of this will be obvious in terms of the knife and all that, but Hitchcock and, and, and this film, what, what do you see there as a connection? Or if you want to say, there is no. What do you see? 
mean, I don't see a lot of. Uh, I mean, I don't. I'm, you can you can draw, you can really stretch and find. I mean, the unknown I killer, the unseen killer. Okay. But but like, <clears throat> I don't think it's really there. I think it's a you know. Filmmakers are going to watch other films and they're going to be inspired and it's going to seep into the style that they're working with. But at the end of the day, um, unless you're doing an obvious, unless you're really, really mimicking something as De Palma does with Dress to Kill or Blowout, you're not capturing that same Hitchcock nuance um okay i'm not saying that I, and I, I understand that but i'm saying like do you see anything what do you see that that uh, not cat i'm not saying that, that is he capturing hitchcock i'm saying what are the elements do you think of hitchcock that may have influenced him that that you see well i think i think after a certain point there are certain filmmakers uh ford hawks hitchcock uh vincent minnelli to a degree that create the language of cinema. So there are there are certain things that they create that they you know the um, with Hitchcock. There's a lot of um, <clears throat> Psycho, for example. There's a lot of keeping Norman Bates's mother in shadow. So you know for obvious reasons that play out later in the film, focusing on the knife. So the knife coming down. Um, it's an immediate visceral kind of. Uh, emotional, it has a, uh, an emotional impact because you're watching something that is very, it's the thing of nightmares, it's the thing of, of, of being um, in danger, but also not simply just being danger, helpless in danger. There's a, there's a difference between just being in danger and being naked in a shower, which is helpless. And he kind of moves into that area with this film, if that's if that's the grammar that we're talking about. But there were moments where I was watching where I think it was Sarah, the the, the friend who's wandering through the academy, and she walks by what looks to me like a like a darkened hallway and she stops there. And I sat there thinking, oh, the killer's fucking arm is gonna come out of that darkness and, and kill her. She's either going to grab her or he's going to cut her. And sure enough, two seconds later, she gets the, she gets the blade. Um, that's, that's Carpenter. Yeah. You know, although Carpenter comes in, Carpenter was, was later. But as I, but the, the language of that had already established for me, she's going to die right here, right now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I don't. I think that's to me that's kind of like part of the the, the charm of it is that it, it's like when you learn a tradition, whether it's blues or flamenco or whatever, um, you already it's kind of like um, in flamenco, for example, um, the listener, the person who's in some forms. Uh, someone is doing rhythm by clapping around to create the, 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 the rhythmic bed for the song. Um, people will exclaim out loud. They'll do these exclamations. They'll, they'll, and, and typically, they'll do them, especially if it's a festive, upbeat, highly syncopated song form, they'll do them They'll do them at the same time, and they'll do them at a certain point in in the count um, on a certain downbeat, because that's kind of like part of the uh, that's part of the language of it. That's part of it's like you don't just blindly just exclaim. I mean, there there can be, but it's also like this is also part of the the music at that point. Um, so to cheer on the singer or the dancer or whatever mm -hmm. you're 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 vocalizing, um, and so you know if you know the music, you know it's coming. Or it, even if it seems to erupt spontaneously from you, it'll erupt. If you know the music, it'll erupt spontaneously from you at that 
important moment. And so that when everyone's doing it and you do it too, and you're not even thinking about doing it, you're now in it. You're part of this thing. That to me is it's kind of like anytime you're part of a tradition, I feel like there are certain things like that that kind of like bring you in. I'm interested in, in that thin line between now take it, take it back to cinema. If you're watching something, there's a thin line between, and I, and I, and I don't know if, if, if there's a way to define that thin line. There's a thin line between I'm watching this thing and I'm like, this is so fucking obvious that um, that I know what's coming. I know that knife is going to come out. And because the knife comes out, but I already called it, um, for some reason, maybe I'm like, ah, I fucking knew it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And the other side of that thin line is, look, look at this. When you, when you see this, that means that this is going to happen. She's going to die. And then the knife comes out, and now you, you're, it's confirmed, and you're like, you're, you know the language. You understand. You understand that it, if, when you're reading something, a question mark, you know it means a question. Yeah. And so now it's like, you know the difference between if something has a comma or not, and knowing it makes a whole difference in the world. Um, that's what, what I'm curious about in terms of the grammar, because it's kind of like, there are those of us, maybe like you, who are going to be like, yeah, the knife came out, um, boring. Or, um, or maybe there are people that are like, I want to see, I want to be part of this. I want to understand this language. Now, beyond um, Hitchcock, I'm curious, you like Keeping Tom, right? The Michael Powell. Yeah, I haven't seen it in a while, but yeah. It's a... It's a well, it's it's interesting that you bring this up. Okay, so here's here's um the vocabulary of film is there. It's how you put put it together. Now of course. with 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 Carpenter, master, building tension, creating this immediacy of danger. You see it in the thing, you see it in Christine, you see it in Escape from New York and Probably best in Halloween. There so that's other, really the, the sorry, that, but that's really the, the the relationship between the director, the screenwriter, and the editor, right? Yeah. Well, it's mostly this. It's mostly the director and the editor. I mean, a director and editor can can save a bad film. They can save it. Um, they can put together a film in the editing bay. You need a you need a good script, but at a certain point the script is written and you have to run with it and you're changing it on the cuff and you're moving it around here much like you would in that, in, in a, in an editing situation. The, the thing about it is that, um, if you don't establish a good storytelling, um, uh, design, if you're not telling a story well, if it's not, tension filled, if it's not captivating, if it's not pulling you in, if I don't care about these characters, like, like I said, it's not about liking the character, it's about being invested in the character. I either want the character to live or I want to see the character die. This film didn't do that for me. Um, I don't know if it did that for you. Were you interested? Can you tell me anything about this young woman? Can you tell me... Um, why she I does what she does. Care. I don't need to know her motivations. I, I, I really don't. I'm not, so what is, I'm not what is it that's a, driving you? It. Well, what's driving you with, with your enjoyment of the film? Just the style, the camera work, the, the production design, Multiple the lighting. All okay. Of all of that, including, and including the, I think within the, the structure of the film, even if I'm not emotionally invested in the character, I'm still curious as to what's going to happen next because um, I'm being guided in a certain direction. Well, that um, that's for me. For me, that doesn't work because that's simply um, that's simply uh, 
storytelling um, functions of uh, you know certain functions of storytelling. Not not functions. What am I, I'm saying? Elements well, of storytelling. Saying. Okay, and the elements of storytelling can be good, but they can be better incorporated in a different film that achieves more. Um, now, when I watch this film, it's really interesting because when we were talking about the Company of Wolves last week, and we were watching, and I was watching this film this week. I've kind of got into, I don't know if it's a good habit or a bad habit of imagining these films told by different directors and how much better the films would be. In both yeah. Company of Wolves yeah. and this film, I'm thinking I would love to see both of those films directed by Holodowski. Because Holodowski, more than, I, 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 I talked about David Lynch, I talked about David Cronenberg. But Holodowski is even more in the imagination, in the the deepest, darkest psyche of the mind. And he could find the really dangerous places and put them on screen. And the fact that Holodowski was directing at the same time as this film was made tells me that he would have been able to create something truly frightening. I don't know if Holodowski ever did a true horror film. What's the one that we saw where the, the circus performer... Santa Sangre. Santa Sangre could... I don't know. Some people can could consider that a horror film. I don't consider it a horror film. I consider it. Holodowski's I mean, that that doesn't define it as horror, but we we did it for that period and all. We did. Um, yeah. We that episode but that was. Two, but that was also sorry, be, episode four or seven. Yeah, but that episode was also before I York. knew his cinema, and I could really, like, for me, Holodowski is a lot like Roy Orbison in music or Tom Waits in music, they don't fit into specific genres. They're their own thing. Holodowski is not, Holodowski does not fit into any discernible genre. Holodowski is Holodowski. Let me, and then I still want to talk about Michael Powell, but let me ask you about, um, uh, cause I know you're, you're, you're very much about the emotional connection with a character. Um, being that someone like, however you want to pronounce it, Jodorowsky, 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 um, yeah. Uh, however, he, um, however you want to do that, his his films and his characters are more symbolic. Yeah. Um, so that would put a viewer even further from uh, like an emotional connection to the character because the character is there to represent something, um, an idea, an archetype, um, some kind of um, esoteric or occult um, process or, or, or being. How do you deal with, with your own like needs as a viewer, basically? Um, how, do you, how do you deal with something like that where some, where one of his characters may be harder to relate to emotionally. How is it that you're um, you're able to bypass that with him? But in the weird, because because of the nature of the storytelling, the skill of what he's putting on screen, the fact that he's doing something that is that is so ambiguous, that is so. Um, when everything around the story is not as simple as as what it is. It's not just a city, it's not just a circus, it's not just a mother and son. There's 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 deeper, darker elements to it. And they're explored because they're going you go further and further into what makes these people who they are without really understanding who they are. It's like it's a lot like what Lynch does. Lynch goes to dreamlike places. So, so Holodowski and Lee Lynch are both dreamlike directors. This would have benefited from that. This would have benefited from the, um, that, that, uh, that uncertainty. As it stands, it's an academy. It's a dance school. And these are real people with, you know, there's no, I never felt that there was an immediacy in the danger. I never felt like, um, 
I thought it was just a very, it, it, it was one of those films where I'm like, oh, this is what's going to happen. Oh, this is what's going to happen. So there was no excitement for me. Whereas sometimes you do watch it like, oh, this, this motherfucker's going to get killed. Right? Oh, there she goes. There she, you know. Um, right. It I wasn't a fun know. ride. It, it just wasn't a fun ride. It was like, it's sometimes you read a book and all of the elements are there. The characters are, are the characters are true and real, but the story, I just don't think is, there are some times when there's not enough, there's just not enough at stake. And horror, horror has the danger of just being Let's kill somebody. Let's watch somebody die. Let's have some blood. Um, by the end, I was just... Uh, by the end, I was happy it was over because I was done watching it. I didn't feel that way with Holodowski. Holodowski, I was like, God damn, that was a ride. What the hell was that? And like, you know, you, you walk. I walk away from Blue Velvet now thinking, what the hell did I just see? Because there's something, there's something very humanistic about it, but something very... What do you mean by humanistic? There's something, the characters are a broken woman who is, who was trapped in this, this abusive relationship, who wants out the curiosity of Kyle MacLachlan's character, the good girl who's set to the side, and then Dennis Hopper's batshit crazy character and his, his little gang. Then you have these moments where it's like, you tell me where in dreams fits into that story um, narratively wise. Why is it there? You know what? It doesn't matter. It's there and it's powerful. Sometimes that's the kind of thing that can derail a film. That scene and um, crying in Spanish in Mulholland Drive, with a lesser director, that, that could derail a film. Why am I here now? Not with Lynch. Lynch... Lynch makes it part of the world that exists there. And in some cases, there's no, there's no real describing or breaking down why it's there. It doesn't make sense, but that's what makes sense about it, is that when nothing, when nothing, is, when nothing is real or natural, you have a weird kind of playing field where you can get away with a lot more. Now, there's a danger in that as well, because you can take it too far. I have to, I'd really have to sit down and think about films that cross, that well, cross like that everything boundary. that Derek Jarman or Kenneth Anger did. See, I don't, fucking hate this well, I don't, see, I don't know Derek Jarman's films. I don't know Kenneth Anger's films, but I might be able to appreciate them. If, if I know, see, knowing Kenneth Anger through you, I'd be a lot more willing to give him leeway as far as my movie watching is concerned because I'd be like, okay, that that's what he's doing with this. That's, you know, this is not standard narrative and he's playing around and, you know. Um, I mean, it's to the extent that I, I would, um, I, I've i avoided doing an episode of it with you because I feel like you're going to feel like utterly wasted your time. Um no, I don't think this and, is an utter waste. Like, even this film is not an utter waste of time. This is, okay, I didn't care for it. This is something that, but it's also something of, of being aware of, you know, I might give another Giallo a try and see where somebody else might have brought something different to it. Maybe Dario Argento is not my cup of tea. He's just, you know, it doesn't work for me. Maybe there's another director working within this genre that is doing something a little bit more meaningful to to my perspective. Yeah, I'm open to that know, idea. You don't know until you until you explore it. But um, yes, but there's also the idea that you know what, um, there are other filmmakers that I want to get into. Of course, you know, um, there but are, even, there, but that again, that's a risk too. Watch out, <laughs> you may not like it. Um, hey, the, that everything is a risk, but you have to. You know, you have to make those deep dives. I'm not afraid of making the deep dives, but I'm also not afraid of walking away from something when it doesn't work for me. And I'm not saying, that, look, there are millions of people that are that 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 worship at the altar of Argento, 
I don't fault them for it. I, you know, if it makes you happy and you have found something that really works for you, by all means, good. I wish it worked for me. I wish the experience was one that I really embraced and loved. And I wish that I had been on the edge of my seat. It just didn't happen. And in some ways, it's the fault of the filmmaker for not creating something that, that builds that tension. And in a lot of ways, it's just not something that, that vibes with me. There's nothing wrong with either one of those um, either one of those uh, storytelling aspects. But um, I know that in the future, the like it's 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 hedging your bets. It's just understanding what works for you and what doesn't work for you and what the likelihood of something working for you later is going to be. Now, in the same respect, you can go back to a filmmaker that you love and walk out of their film going, what the fuck was that? That has happened. Where you walk away from yeah, them and she's like, that was bad. Yeah, actors. Yeah. Well, people, can, yeah, people can, people can oh. disappoint and they disappoint all the time. Am I going to sit here and say... You know, De Niro and Pacino getting together for Righteous Kill. Does that in any way negate everything that has come after? No. But it does lead you to believe that the likelihood of future endeavors might be affected. Because you're looking at us, you know, that, and this is, this is the professionalism of it. This is, this is where actors and producers and directors and writers go after something where it's like, let's just get them together for this one thing. You know, you look at, you look at Pacino's career since Son of a Woman. You look at De Niro's career, um, late nineties on, they haven't made great films. They've made a, they've made a handful of great films. They've made a handful of really good films, but the return is less than it was in the eighties and the seventies when they were hungry and, and they were fighting for every, every bit in that same respect. I can say that I was watching Duvall during that same period, and Duvall rarely let me down. Not to the same degree. There was I, I don't remember. I can't think of a time when I watched a Robert Duvall performance where I thought that was a paycheck. And I can say it definitely with both Pacino and De Niro. So it's 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 understanding the the commerce aspect of of the art. Now with this film. There are a lot of people who, who love it. That's good. It means it means that there's some validity to it. But at the same time, it's just it not it does it's not something that I need to go back to. You know? Um But given the opportunity to watch something else, I might give it a shot. If I'm in the right mood, if things are, you know, and who knows? Every once in a while you find gold out there, but you have to be willing to explore. And unlike what you describe, yeah, I have, I have my wheelhouse. There's no doubt about that, but I'm willing to explore other things. So, you know, I mean, film is, film is a very strange medium. There's a, there's a potential for, for greatness and embarrassment, but a lot of it's just mediocrity. This, I thought, was mediocre. Going back to the grammar, um, and yeah. to try to, like, maybe, um, before we wrap up, to try to maybe separate the the, the mediocre from the, the more important... Um, no, I wouldn't say more important. Um, that's no, not more important. I mean, whatever, uh, whatever. Okay, open up a fucking. What's an antonym? You know what I mean? Like I don't know. You said it. Whatever. You said it. I mean, uh, you know, it's not. No, no, no. Mediocrity but, uh, yes, is, but, is. No, I said I said it over out of mediocrity. That's uh, and I I respect you challenging me for I made the points and I'll okay, but I I said important or whatever I said that in response to the mediocre. So, mm -hmm. uh, 
fill in the blank as, as an antonym for fucking mediocre. Um, so the mediocre or the grand, okay? Um, so mm -hmm. Hitchcock, Psycho, nineteen sixty, Peeping Tom, nineteen sixty. Mm -hmm. What do you see? Kind of a trajectory there that that I see. Do you see a? a we talked about okay. You you mentioned some of the stuff with Hitchcock uh, and the grammar leading into this, and using some of those well, some of the language. Do you see well, something there between Peeping Tom and also maybe uh, Brian De Palma? <laughs> like, where does this fit in with that? What do you think it got from it? What do you think that it it? What do you mean in reference yeah, to Suspiria it, or or just yeah, it's in reference to Suspiria. That's what we're talking about. No, because you're talking about you're talking about Peeping Tom and and Psycho. You're talking about Peeping Tom and listen, Hitchcock. You're listen, not talking listen. about yes, but I've already made this point like several times. So like so uh, that I see a trajectory between Hitchcock. I see this line between Hitchcock, Michael Powell's Peeping Tom. I saw elements of of, of Brian De Palma. I saw these different things oh. in this film. And things and and his influence, this, Argento's influence, out of this film into stuff that came after. Well, if you're bringing so, this up, though, but like with with Pete, with the Hitchcock Michael Powell comparison, De Palma, De Palma is more of a direct homage to Hitchcock. Powell, what Powell did, and it's been it's been talked about in the past, but it needs to be reiterated here. What Powell did was much more powerful because Powell focused his camera as the eye of the audience, which is what derailed his career. If you watch Peeping Tom, you're the killer, which the made it more unnerving for audiences. They felt they felt that it was insulting. They felt that it was the, the they felt like how the fuck could you put me in a position where I'm the killer? Whereas with with um Hitchcock. Hitchcock was voyeuristic. De Palma's voyeuristic as well. De Palma is voyeuristic as a as a not a response, but as a as a continuation of what Hitchcock did. Powell did something completely different. It's seemingly the same, but it's not. Hitchcock watched you from a window. Hitchcock watched through a peeping a peeping tom hole in a wall. Hitchcock watched from an above angle as a woman is showering. What Powell did was he mounted the saber onto the camera tripod. So as you're killing this woman in that film, you are the murderer. So it took it out of the voyeuristic. It's not voyeurism anymore. It's it's this is first person. Yeah, it's first person. It's very it's it's very much. It's an indictment of the audience. People didn't like that. What now this is not okay. that. This is. I okay. <clears throat> I I I think you're well, you're latching on to the to that, and that's a big difference. I get that. Um, but I guess what I'm trying trying to say is do you see elements of the grammar what you said you know that being said okay there's a difference in terms of perspective mm -hmm. point of view um but do you see elements of the grammar that do you see a tradition between hitchcock Powell, brian de palma that may be influenced are gentle and how do, do you see what are the things that you think he missed or what do you think see the things that you think that he incorporated that affected him uh, that's what I'm looking for is like I don't see a I don't see a direct history. line between Hitchcock and De Palma into Argento or Hitchcock into Argento what I see Argento taken from is the is the haunted mansion trope the the mystery of of a of a of a house with many rooms what are in the rooms? What are the secrets of that rooms? Um, with you know the bad spirits that are controlling that the 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 slow realization, the slow reveal 
that it's uh, it's it's Rosemary's baby to a degree. It's a worshiping of evil. That is what's there. I don't see it so much as Hitchcock. Hitchcock and De Palma both exist in the in the real, in the um whatever the opposite of supernatural is. Natural? Natural, I guess. Well yeah. It doesn't sound very um appealing as far as uh, a descriptor, but yeah. I don't I don't it's see that. Realism basically. Yeah, yeah. There there's there well, heightened realism, murderous realism. Um you see that with Hitchcock, you see that with um this is more along the lines of William Castle. This is more along the lines of ghosts and goblins and spooks coming out of the fucking darkness and uh, uh, you know a semi uh, you know a semi retarded or or somewhat uh, mannered I guess uh, uh, servant. Um, it's all it's all pretty obvious in this film, and it's there's so there's no there's no real level of tension built because it's all right there there's never for me at least there was never a moment where i felt that the danger wasn't obvious you know it's a spooky house it might be a school but it's a spooky house it's it's anywhere that you it's it's um it's a place with untold evils that are slowly revealed to you and you know basically a gateway to hell or whatever else you want to call it but a Hitchcock or De Palma no no At, you know separate from the grammar of cinema no no that's what I'm that that's uh, that's part of what I'm asking about mm -hmm. is like what grammar do you see that he used um, well you know um, I, shit coming I out of the darkness I'm not saying, like, is, it, is it the Italian De Palma I mean the Italian Italian De Palma. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm curious about the style, the grammar, the the shots, the the, the with the knife coming out, the stuff that not necessarily subject matter. I'm I'm, I'm curious about that's what I, that's what I've been kind of talking about is mm -hmm. the, the grammar. Yeah. Well, you're talking about you know you shots of of knives coming out, knife wielding without. Um, you know, the mystery of who is killing, who, you know, who, who is this killer? Why Just is this person, yeah, why is this person being targeted? It's all of those elements of, elements of mystery. Now that is certainly there. Whether or not it's successful is, is really, you know, kind of up to whoever's watching. And apparently, a lot of people, a lot of people embrace it. So it's it's it is very successful on on a certain level. I'm not going to rob it in, of that. In when you were at film school, did does Jello did, did it come, come up? up? No, it, mm -hmm. no. But back then, in the early '90s, it wasn't so much. Um, there wasn't this embracing of this is what would be considered B movie. Argento was was not elevated critically until years later, I think, when people like Tarantino started expounding on him, and you know, it, it, it's a it's pretty much it's a good thing because it made it made movie watching and movie loving a little bit more democratic. So what can what could be considered low brow or B movie or um. Uh, dismissive, dismissible, is no longer as such. So, so you mean basically just taking it out of the hands of the critics and the academics and well, and the critics don't know everything. Like the, the, neither do I. I, I, you know, I'm all I can do is give you my opinion based on my understanding of what a film, what a film typically does, or the grammar of film, like you, like we're talking about right now. What does it utilize? Does it utilize it well? Um, but at the end of the day, it's a visceral experience. You're either laughing, you're sad, or you're scared out of your mind. And that's what I want. I want I want that visceral when it all comes down to it, you can you can make the statements, you can flower it up, 
you can be as um, you can be you, you can really get into the minutia of what a film is and what it does but at the end of the day do you have a good time with it do you feel like you took something important from it and that's to go back to the beginning of this episode that's what i want i want those moments where i watch a film and and I think, Jesus Christ, I didn't know that story, or I didn't know it was going to go that way, or I can't wait to see it again. It touches something with you. Right now, I'm looking at a shelf and um, a number of movies that I'm getting ready to watch, and one of them is Big Night. I don't know if you've ever seen Big Night. It's mm -hmm. a Stanley What's Tucci, Campbell Scott. It's about two brothers, two, oh. two Italian immigrant brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cooks. Well, uh, I don't. I haven't seen it, but um, mm -hmm. a friend of ours loves yes. that film, he, and it's a great film. But it's a film. People don't necessarily think of cooks as artists. You and I do, I believe. And there's a level to the artistry in this film, and such a passion and a love for the 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 process of both cooking, presentation, and dining. That when you when you walk away from the film, you do feel like that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for passion. And some films are able to deliver, and some films are not. But what you do realize is you can find passion in any story. You can no, no. Let me let me re rephrase that. You can imbue any story with passion. The filmmaker can make something that is not just a comedy, that is not just a drama, that is not just a slasher film. There can be the passion of the storytelling. For whatever faults I have with Tarantino and that we've expressed on this show, there is a passion for the storytelling. And I think that's what keeps me going back to his movies despite my feelings about him and some aspects of the film. I don't think I've ever said that I don't think I've ever said that I wholeheartedly hated any movie he's ever done. There are films that didn't necessarily work for me, The Hateful Eight, Parts of Inglorious Bastards, but the passion is there. I just don't want to hear him talk about it. With this film, I don't know. It, it just seemed like, um, it seemed rote. It just seemed very obvious. But I don't know what came before Argento, and I'm not really sure what came after, because like I said, horror is not my genre. So, that's, uh, that's, one, that's one impression of it. This was our first take of Suspiria, um, probably our last. Um, Unless you want to watch the remake, which I'm not really interested in. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I doubt, I highly doubt that um, that if you didn't like the original, um, I'm sure you're not going to like the remake. Um, Probably not, but you know what? There might be another director who interprets this type of material in a different way that of could be rewarding. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. All I'm saying is sometimes you just got to head your bets. And I'm not going back to, I'm not going back to another peck and paw. I'm not looking for one more peck and paw that's old men doing old man shit. I'm not, you know, I've done that. I've seen those films. They're good. If another one comes up, that's great. But what I, I am mean, looking I think for, old man shit is, is is I see that in our future. I'm, well, you oh. know, as we get older, it's it becomes more and more powerful. But there's a, there's a flip side to that coin, and it's as old men age, there is this desire to go back to youth. So I've been thinking about that with um, Spielberg's Capturing the Freedmen, or not Capturing the, the Fablemans. The Fablemans. Mm -hmm. I want to see that film. I, I'm really interested in that 
youthful kind of excitement and energy and um, passion for, yeah, say it a lot, but passion no, for the thing that drives no, you. I'm laughing because you say the Fablemans and I go, mm. um, um, and my mm is, was so fucking stuck up um, because that's, that's my, that's outside of my, you know, as, as so-called open as I am, that's when I'm like, that sounds like the most vanilla, um, yeah. rated G, uh, trifle. Yeah. Um, uh, I wouldn't doubt it, but do you know the, do you know the, uh, the history of Spielberg's fucked up family? I don't, but there you but go. It's, it's am, in there, <laughs> but I am, I'm curious yeah. um, about the horror, um, behind Fable ones. Behind the fable. Yeah. Um, Which we, we, uh, we have so, about growing up Jewish in Scottsdale, Arizona. <laughs> I mean, and, yeah. and I don't subscribe to the, I don't subscribe to the logic of kind of like, if it's, it, if I laugh, it's funny. If I don't laugh, it's not funny. Uh, I, I don't subscribe to that logic because it's kind of like, well, there's also humor that I don't understand, so I'm not going to laugh because I don't I don't get it. Um, if I get it, then maybe I'll laugh. Yeah, so but you do know that's that a different thing. you do know when you like something versus when you don't like it, and you know when and, when and you I know also, when that misses the I mark also know, with you. And I also, but I separate those two. I also know that just because I like it doesn't mean that it's a problem with the thing. Um, that's something completely distinct. Um, I'm not, and never have never been a big fan of uh, of blondes. Of who? Blondes. Oh, blondes. Women okay. with blonde hair. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to take that, take anything away from fucking blondes. You know what I mean? And it's not like I've never checked out a blonde woman before, um, or been attracted to. Um, or had a nice conversation with. Mm -hmm. I watched a movie with. That being said, this has been Suspiria, Giallo, and the Jolly films are out there. Um, if any of you are curious, probably some of you, many of you, have already seen. Um, knowing some of the people who listen to to us um, they probably already been in those dark chambers or those red saturated chambers um, to include Slim Slim thank you for coming out of the shadows and donating to us everyone else is donating monthly it appears um, anonymously you perverts thank you buy me a coffee dot com slash watch this with Rick Ramos next week we continue. No, watch Rick Ramos. Yes, thank you. Now watch this. Watch buy, me a cop, buy me a coffee dot com slash watch Rick Ramos. Yeah. Next week more horror, more arguments. <laughs> Goodbye.